for having me here tonight. It's, it's really a pleasure to come to your beautiful town. Um, I've, I've come up here often on my own and uh, it's, it's just a wonderful time to come and spend with you tonight. Uh, the topic tonight, of course, is the Lincoln assassination, but you really cannot talk about the Lincoln assassination without mentioning the Civil War, of course. And I've been a student of the Civil War since so I was about that high. And you know, the Civil War strikes me as something that it, it's, it's a critical juncture in our history. It's what makes us Americans. It's one of those things that creates our consciousness as Americans. And you know, to me when I study the Civil War, I look at it as almost, Abraham Lincoln was almost put on this planet for one reason, and that was to keep this country together. And you know, if it hadn't been for him, I, I really think there was no other person that could have done it. We would probably be two countries today, possibly even several even smaller balkanized countries today. And sometimes when I look at it that way, you can almost see the hand of fate at work in history, in, in American history. It's, it's almost like uh, you can see these things happening in American history where you see little signs here and there. One sign that I always look at is, uh, that tells me that the hand of fate is at work is when we had two of our presidents, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, both die on the same day, and that was the 4th of July. And I, I see that in the Civil War, and I see the hand of fate at work with Abraham Lincoln. And I've, I've spent years researching this, reading about it, traveling down to the locations, filming, photo photographing all these areas, and it's my pleasure to present this to you tonight. So without any further ado, we'll begin. And of course, if there are any questions or comments, I'd, I'd love to entertain your questions and comments at the end of the lecture. Thank you. Just a few things here. For those people that can't read the slide, let me just read this for you. This is a quote from Abraham Lincoln. Those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves, and under a just God cannot long retain it. Here's another quote. John Wilkes Booth, our country owed all of our troubles to him, meaning Lincoln, of course, and God simply made me an instrument of his punishment. Now, the Civil War definitely, uh, if you went on the street today and you asked the common citizen on the street, it's sad to say that if you said, what was the costliest and bloodiest war in our history, they'd probably tell you World War II. That, that is a, an error, of course. The, look at these statistics here. We're not getting you. Okay. We're not getting you. Your face. Okay. You. Is that too much? Mm-hmm. Perfect. Fine. So Thank, you. Thank you. If you look at these statistics here, 360,000 casualties on the Union side. On the Confederate side, 258,000. Over half a million dead in this war. And ladies and gentlemen, we don't really realize it when we uh, think of the Civil War, but the, the casualty rate was so high that even in one battle you had more casualties than the Vietnam War. Whole villages would be wiped out simply because the men of that village would join the same unit and go off to fight in a battle and in that battle if that unit got wiped out there would be no men coming home to that village. Today we don't realize the cost of this war, what was paid to keep this country together to end slavery. Here are some examples of some of those numbers here. Gettysburg Casualties, over 50,000. And I believe Vietnam was in the 55,000. One in three days, more casualties than an entire war. And it was also the first war to be photographed. 
people knew what was going on. In years past, you'd read about it maybe, but you couldn't actually see the carnage. People could see the carnage. They could see the photographs in the battlefield. They knew the costs. They knew when their sons weren't coming home. Chickamauga. Over 30,000 casualties. And of course here I'm, I'm mixing the Confederate and the Union because they are all Americans. And this war was not, not a war where the, the casualties were simply from battle. Many of the casualties came from battlefield illness. This is a time when uh, they didn't understand uh, the germ theory, they didn't understand cleanliness. You'd, you'd have one group of soldiers washing their dishes in a river and then upstream you'd have another group watering their horses. Uh, you'd have on the battlefield, you'd have surgeons uh, operating and doing amputations with the same saw over and over and over again. There were many casualties simply just due to battlefield illness, dysentery, all sorts of things here. Chancellorsville, the third most costly battle in the Civil War. This was four years of utter hell. And I'll tell you, many people today, uh, Abraham Lincoln was iconic. During the war he was hated, both south and north because of these massive casualties, but he stood his ground. He kept going. And then finally, finally it ended. And the, the death knell for the war began with Petersburg. Petersburg is uh, in Virginia, just outside of Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy at the time. And for months and months and months, they fought a new kind of warfare, trench warfare, something that we'd see later in another war here. But finally, Petersburg fell, and it was only a short matter of time before Richmond would fall. They knew it. It was in fact that same day that Richmond was evacuated after Petersburg fell. And on their way out, the Confederates took a scorched earth policy and they decided to burn it to the ground. These are photographs of Richmond after. I was struck by these as a child looking at these. I thought, wow, that looks like a picture of Dresden or some a bombing of Germany. The, the whole city was totally and utterly wiped out. Not by the Union, but by their own people. This was really the beginning of the end. And most people knew it. Abraham Lincoln, this shows you the type of person he was. Abraham Lincoln a few days after the fall of Richmond decided to take a tour of Richmond. And if you look here in this picture, he's got very little security here. And he's also got his little son, Tad, by the hand. At any time, at any moment, there could have been a Confederate sniper or somebody that came up and shot him. He paid no attention to it. He had many death threats. Uh, his wife would constantly be on him about avoiding things like this. And he would always have the same retort. If they're going to get me, they're going to get me. I'm not going to stop what I'm doing. And he went into Richmond and the slaves were coming up to him, falling at his knees and thanking him. And he would tell them to get up off their knees because there's no one that you should be on your knees for except for God. And then he went to what they called the Confederate White House, Jefferson Davis's office, and plunked himself down right in his desk. Kind of a victory, a victory lap for Abraham Lincoln there. But you know, the war was still not over yet. 
General Robert E. Lee was still out there with the Army of Virginia. He thought he had one last hope. He thought he could punch through the Union lines and get to uh, General Johnson, hook up armies, and start attacking again. He made an attempt, and he ran into a wall of blue. He knew that was it. Letters were exchanged between he and Ulysses S. Grant, and he sued for peace. He agreed to surrender. And this is where he surrendered. Appomattox Courthouse. The terms were already agreed upon pretty much when they got there. Each was supposed to arrive and sign the proper documents and turn over their weapons. And this is how Robert E. Lee arrived. As always, the gentleman, dressed to the nines, his sword gleaming in the sun, his boots highly polished with his sash on. And this is who he was to surrender to. <laughs> Ulysses S. Grant. Now, Grant normally would dress in the uniform of a private, of course, because he was smart. He knew that snipers were looking for generals. But he came in to surrender to Robert E. Lee in a dirty uniform. His boots were muddy. And he came in to surrender like that. Now, Grant, Grant was uh, Abraham Lincoln's favorite general. And they didn't call him unconditional surrender for nothing. That, that's, his name was Ulysses S., but it was, he was also called unconditional surrender Grant. And he was, Lincoln finally found a general that would do what he wanted, to be relentless. And that was Ulysses S. Grant. Now, for all his faults, and there were, there were quite a few, uh, he was the best man for the job. And boy, were the other generals jealous. They approached Lincoln at one point and said, General Lincoln, you know that, that Grant? He's a drunk. And Abraham Lincoln said, well, find out what brand of whiskey he drinks and get it for all my generals. This was Ulysses S. Grant. They stepped into the room together, shook hands, Grant reminded Robert E. Lee that they had met during the uh, Mexican-American War and Lee could not remember. But Grant remembered Lee because he was the top general in the country. He was actually asked to lead the Union Army before the Civil War, but his allegiance was to Virginia. The agreement was pretty simple. All men would swear an oath that they would not act out against the United States. They would stack their arms and go home. And that's what happened to the Army of Northern Virginia. Now, with any war, there are still guerrilla bands out there, and it took a little while to mop that up. But this, this was essentially the end of the war. And people were celebrating. As they say, this is the night they drove old Dixie down. Now, months before this, there was a plot to kidnap Abraham Lincoln. Let me tell you about the plot. This plot was uh, designed to kind of jumpstart the Confederacy. And the idea was to kidnap Abraham Lincoln Confederates would kidnap Abraham Lincoln, bring him back into the Confederacy and hold him hostage. And he, they were to hold him hostage for the release of all Confederate prisoners in the North. And this would just restart the war. This plot was set in motion in October of 1864. As the, the war is winding down, this plot is taking shape though. And here are the conspirators who were involved in this plot. Here is the leader. John Wilkes Booth. Now, let me tell you a little bit about John Wilkes Booth here. John Wilkes Booth was from a storied acting family, the Booth family. They were famous throughout the Western world, in Europe and in America. John was the youngest, 
And he actually got to start acting a little bit late. He had only been acting about five years at the time of the assassination. But he became known through his parts as the handsomest man in America. And he was known throughout his America. Most people knew this face. Back during the Civil War, we didn't have TV, we didn't have, you couldn't even uh, publish photographs in the newspaper. But what most families did have was a book full of something called carte de visites, little postcards. And they would usually have famous people in these cards. You'd have Abraham Lincoln, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Grant, You'd, and you would have many celebrities of the time. John Wilkes Booth was probably in many of the books of the people across the country. He was, I guess you could call him the George Clooney of the day. Everybody knew who he was. And if you haven't noticed, he liked to have his picture taken too. He was 27 years old at the time of the assassination. During the war, he continued his acting uh, occupation, but he was also somewhat of a, a Confederate agent. He uh, helped ferry quinine across the Potomac. He, he uh, was able to bring letters back and forth, raise funds, things of that nature. He was very outspoken as a, a man of the South. He believed that the United States government was exceeding their, their, their constitutional rights and forcing states to obey what they wanted and taking away states' rights. He believed himself a patriot. And he began to lead this group. He got this group together with this plot to kidnap Lincoln and jumpstart the Civil War. And here are his partners. This is Michael O'Laughlin, who was about 25 years old at the time of the assassination. O'Laughlin was a, a, a friend of John Wilkes Booth. They actually grew up on the same street together. They went to academy together and they formed a relationship early on. Now O'Laughlin, like many of the other conspirators that you're going to see here, actually had fought on the Confederate side and ended up with a, a medical leave and was pretty much doing kind of a, 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 a uh, ordinary job at the time of the assassination. When you read about him, you kind of get the feeling that he, get, he got in on this to get for a little excitement almost. His life had turned very mundane. And he joined Booth along with this man. This is Samuel Arnold. He was about 31 at the time of the assassination. And he met John Wilkes Booth at school. They both went to the military academy together. And uh, he came on board too. He was also a Confederate soldier for a short time and had checked out on a medical discharge. Now, at this juncture I'd like to tell you about a little trip that John Wilkes Booth took which uh, enabled him to cross the paths of some other of these conspirators. In 1864 he went to Montreal and there it's said that he met with several Confederate agents Believe it or not, they called Montreal, they called it the Richmond of Canada. They called it the Confederacy, the, the uh, capital of the Confederacy in Canada because so many agents and Confederates had, had ended up in Montreal. And the reason being was probably because it was close to the border. And I think that at some point they were actually planning to try to invade the North from Canada with these people up in Montreal. Anyway, Booth began to uh, meet with these men. We don't know exactly what they talked about, but what we do know is that he came back to the United States with a rather large sum of money and two letters of introduction. And one of those letters was to, this, to an introduction to this man. Dr. Samuel Mudd, who lived in Maryland. Now, Mudd was also somewhat of an underground agent for the Confederacy, doing much the same as Booth had, uh, transferring messages, uh, giving intelligence on troop movements, whatnot. And Booth and Mudd met together. He agreed to be part of the kidnap plot. And he introduced him to this fellow, this young fellow here. This is John Surratt. 
John Surratt Jr. actually. John's father had started a post office and a tavern down in uh, what is uh, called Clinton, Maryland now. It was called Surrattsville at the time. And after his father died, he, he wanted to join the priesthood. But then the Civil War came and he decided to be a Confederate agent instead. And then he went into much of the same thing. His post office became kind of a way station for Confederates coming and going. Maryland, as you know, was a, was a, a non-slave state and he was giving information as well. So he was another person that was kind of uh, operating underground here and he was brought on board in this conspiracy to kidnap Lincoln. Now, his mother was not really involved. Uh, according to her, she just owned the places where they all met. These conspirators met in two locations. They met in the Surratt Tavern, which was located in Clinton, Maryland, then Surrattsville, and also the Surratt Boarding House, which was run by Mary Surratt, which was on, I believe, H Street in Washington, D.C. Now, after this was all said and done, as you probably know, she was executed as one of the conspirators. And you will see that she was involved to some degree. However, for the most part, during the build-up to the assassination, I believe she was right. She was just the one that was running the boarding house and the tavern really wasn't involved too much in this. And then there was George Atrazot. He was, he was a little bit older than the rest of them. He was uh, in his thir late 30s. And he was a German immigrant, newly arrived. He had spent several years in the area. Now, he was somebody that they brought into the conspiracy because he was somewhat of a backwoodsman. He knew the rivers, he knew the trails in the woods, and they needed somebody like that when they grabbed Lincoln, they were, where they were not going to be going on the highways. They were going to be going on the, the pathways and the, the trails to avoid capture. And he was kind of the guide, one of the guides, I should say. And the other fellow who was to act as a guide as well was David Harold. He was a young man. He was a, a clerk at the Navy Yard in Washington, D.C. And uh, he was also another person that knew the lay of the land and was to act as a guide. Now this fellow, his name was Lewis Powell. He started off life as Lewis Powell, later changed it to pain. He was to be the muscle. Six foot three, he was the one that was going to grab Lincoln. Now he had quite a history himself. He started off as a Confederate soldier at the beginning of the war, fought at the Battle of Gettysburg, was captured, was put in a, a northern prison and escaped. And then he joined the fabled Mosby's Rangers and fought with them until he ran into Booth and he decided that he wanted to join this confederacy too. And he jumped in with both feet. Lewis Powell, or Payne, as I'll refer to him from here on out. Ooh. <laughs> now, as, as we already know, Lincoln didn't travel with a lot of security. And lots of people knew this. He would, he would tell his, uh, his detailed, men on his detail, oh, go home and stay with your wife, things like that. And you can see from this, this uh, picture of him riding through town that he, uh, he really didn't put much credence in a lot of security. And they knew this. The conspirators found out through Booth's contacts at Ford's Theater that the uh, theater group would be putting on a play at Campbell Hospital outside of Washington, D.C. They thought, and they found out that Lincoln had been invited, Lincoln was going to this, it was for veterans, he was going to go to this play, and they thought they would intercept him on the way. They got their, their, all their things together, they lay in wait in the woods, and they knew the exact route that he was going to be taken, and then, down the street, they saw a carriage, and they were just about to pounce when they looked in the window, and it was Salmon P. Chase, not the president. <laughs> 
Booth later found out that the president at the last minute had changed his plans. And he was actually at the time of this play was here at the National Hotel. The exact hotel that John Wilkes Booth had been living in. So if Booth had stayed home he probably would have run into Lincoln rather than trying to kidnap him here. This, this plot fell apart and they were waiting for another chance. And it was just about this time that Petersburg fell and then Richmond fell and all hope was gone. This plot was, was abandoned. And then after the fall of Richmond, Abraham Lincoln took to the balcony of the White House and made a speech. In this speech, he went a little bit further than just freeing the slaves. He talked about giving them the elective franchise which means the vote. As he was speaking in the audience was John Wilkes Booth and Lewis Payne. It said that John Wilkes Booth turned to Payne and said, that's the last speech he'll give. And this plot to kidnap began to be a plot to assassinate. It wasn't, there wasn't anything planned out, it was just we're going to change it to a plot to assassinate. Now some of the men that were involved, O'Laughlin and uh, Arnold, bowed out immediately. They didn't want anything to do with it and they said, nope, oh, we're out. And it was basically down to Payne, Harold, and Booth, and Atrazot. We come to the fatal day and I'd like to just share with you the movements of each man. What did Abraham Lincoln do on his last day? What did John Wilkes Booth do? There, there still was no solid plan yet. It's amazing how quickly it came together. This is what Abraham Lincoln did on April 14th, 1865. Started off the day with a cabinet meeting with the radical Republicans, these men wanted to punish the South. They wanted to take revenge. They looked at the people of the South as traitors and traitors should be treated as such. Lincoln was far more lenient. He wanted to bring them back into the fold. He was talking about forgiveness to bring them back. And in that meeting that morning, that's that was the, the vein of what he was talking about. And also at that meeting uh, walked in Ulysses S. Grant. Now prior to this, President Lincoln had invited him to see a play at Ford's Theater that night. And Ulysses S. Grant bowed out and said that he had, he had a a prior engagement in New York and just couldn't make it. Well, the truth was really that uh, his wife detested Mary Lincoln. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mary Lincoln was a very jealous woman. And many, many of the general's wives had trouble with her because if they so much as looked at her husband, oh, there would be hell to pay. And Julia Grant knew that she didn't want anything with being with Mary Lincoln, so they, they made up an excuse that they had to go to New York, which they, they eventually did go there. So Grant was out of the picture now. now. Many historians say that Lincoln asked many other people to go and that they all couldn't go. He, he eventually did find a, a young couple to go with him, though. In that afternoon, Mary and Abraham took a, a ride throughout Washington in this carriage that you see here. And according to her later writings, it was one of the first times that he had a smile on his face. It was like a weight was lifted off of his shoulders. This, this horrible, wretched war was finally over. He talked about what he was going to do after the presidency. He wanted to visit the Holy Land. He wanted to visit America. He had all these plans and it was a beautiful afternoon for them.
And then they came back and they, they dined with Tad and Robert, talking about the future as well, I'm sure. And then eventually, they prepared to go to the theater. Now, conversely, at the same time as this was all going on here, John Wilkes Booth was making his movements that day. He started out his morning in the National Hotel. Witnesses said that he was seen uh, breakfasting with three lovely young ladies. See, just like George Clooney. <laughs> and uh, then he decided to go to Ford's Theater, which was somewhat of his home away from home. This is where he got his mail. And he went to pick up his mail at Ford's Theater. This is how it appears today. Talked to one of the Ford brothers and discovered that Abraham Lincoln was going to be at the theater, along with Ulysses S. Grant. Perfect. And he swung into action immediately. This was his moment. This was his home turf. He knew the lay of the theater and he knew exactly what to do. At about 2.30 he ended up at the Surratt boarding house, which you see here. This is on H Street in uh, Washington, D.C. And Mrs. Surratt was there. He arranged for her to have some packages transported out to their tavern in Clinton. And then also he requested that uh, part of that parcel include his field glasses and what he referred to as his shooting irons, two carbines, rifles. And then she would send her man Lloyd, who actually ran the tavern, out with these materials and sent, sent word to him that somebody would be coming to pick them up later tonight and be ready for them. This is how the Surratt boarding house looks today. It's a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> it's still there though, which is good. And then Strangely enough, uh, Booth made a stop at the Kirkwood House. This is where Vice President Johnson was staying. Left a little uh, a cryptic note in his mailbox. Uh, it basically said, came by, didn't want to disturb you, wanted to know if you were home. It's almost like he was checking to see if Johnson was in or not. And then, he met one of his friends on the streets of Washington, D.C., a writer for the National Intelligentsia, and handed him an envelope with a letter in it. This letter is, was Booth's manifesto. This is his explanation for what he was going to do that night. And he wanted this in the papers all over the country so everybody could see what a hero he was. He truly expected that people were going to build statues for him in the South, that he would be the hero of the South, and that everyone would know why he did this. And he gave this to his friend who was the reporter. Now after the assassination, he opened it and he realized what had happened. He destroyed the letter because he didn't want to be thought of being involved in this assassination. It wasn't until 30 years later that he revealed that Booth had given him this letter. So Booth's reason for doing all these things never hit the papers. And another strange thing happened that afternoon too. Ulysses S. Grant and his wife were on their way out of town. And they saw coming down the street towards them this man on this this fiery black steed with a black mustache and jet black hair coming right towards them. This man was John Wilkes Booth. He rode right by Grant, went down to the end of the street, reared up on his horse and rode right by him again, giving him the most evil glare, and then rode off. Probably figured that he would get him later that night.
And then he made preparations in Ford's theater here. Here is the box where the president would be sitting that night. And there is a small vestibule room that leads to that box. Here is a picture of that vestibule door. Now Booth had the whole plan in mind. What he decided to do was take an old music stand, break the top and the bottom off, and use it as somewhat of a buttress to jam that door closed and so nobody could get in after he got in there. Also, the other conspirators were given their roles later that day. Of course, John Wilkes Booth, ever the star, would play the starring role. He would be the one to assassinate Lincoln. George Atrazot would be the one to assassinate Vice President Johnson at the Kirkwood House. He had actually gotten a room there and was prepared to do it. And Davy Harold and Lewis Payne, Lewis Powell, were assigned to kill the Secretary of State Seward. This brings us to 8 p.m. shortly before the play. The Lincolns had been able to get this young couple, Major Rathbun and his fiance Clara, to attend the play with them. And of course, they were happy beyond compare to be going to the play with the President of the United States, and they agreed. And the play that night was a play called Our American Cousin. And this was a play that Lincoln was really looking forward to because the plot of this play was that a rube or a hillbilly from the United States was going to visit his cultured British cousin and the interplay between the two. And he looked at himself, he looked at himself as that hillbilly, that rube, and he was looking forward to seeing the exchanges between the, the, the proper British and the, and the man from the hills. This, this play starred a, a rather renowned actress herself who actually uh, lived in Massachusetts, Laura Keene. And she was the star. This was a comedy. And they arrived at the theater. It was, uh, the play had already started, but as soon as the Lincolns entered the theater, everything stopped. The band struck up, hail to the chief, as the victorious president marched to his box. Everybody turned around to see the president. He and Mary took their seats in the box, and the play resumed. And they were sitting there. Some folks said that they actually saw them sitting side by side, Mary's hand on Abraham's hand. Finally, some normalcy had come back to them. They're enjoying a play. This is the back of Ford's Theater. At about nine o'clock, John Wilkes Booth arrives at the back of this theater with his, his fiery steed. He gets this man. This is Edmund Spangler, who was the, I guess, the set carpenter for Ford's Theater and also a rabid Confederate. He gets him to come out and he says, Ed, can you hold my horse for me? And Edmund says, sure, I'll hold the horse for you. And as Booth went in and spent more time than he thought, Edmund had to get back to work. He was, he was at work there. So he handed the the horse off to a young boy named Peanuts. Peanuts Burroughs was his name. And he was given the job of holding John Wilkes Booth's horse. Now, Booth entered the theater and what he did was he went across underneath the stage. Here's a, here's a diagram of the theater here. You can see the stage area up here. Booth came in the back door went underneath the stage to the side of the theater into an alleyway which led to a saloon. Went to the saloon and bided his time. Probably had a glass of brandy to stiffen his nerves because he was waiting for the exact right time to strike. He knew this play, he knew the lines, and he knew when people were going to laugh and he was waiting for the biggest laugh of the night and he watched the time. And then finally, just around 10 o'clock, he entered the theater as the play was going on, went up to the upper balcony and began to walk down here. 
Walk to the door. At the door were no security. There, there was no uh, bodyguard detail. There was Lincoln's footman, his valet. And John Wilkes Booth pulled out his business card. And of course, this is like, John, uh, this is like uh, George Clooney showing up to see President Obama. Sure, go right in. And they let him in. He got into the vestibule, took that wooden buttress that he had put there, propped it up against the door, and then he looked in. And he could see through this hole in the door Abraham Lincoln. Now many people have said that Booth actually drilled the hole in the door. Uh, th this hole was drilled by the Ford brothers because Lincoln was uh, very much often a guest at the theater and it was their way of keeping an eye on him to see if he needed anything. So Booth knew that and he watched and he waited and he knew the exact time that that line was coming up. That line came up. He saw Lincoln entered the booth and shot Lincoln in the back of the head. The bullet entered right behind the left ear and ended up behind the right eye. Lincoln just slumped. Nobody in the theater actually knew what was happening until they saw a billowing white smoke come out over the stage and then they heard the wails of Mary. And then they noticed there was a scuffle going on up in the box. Major Rathbun immediately got out of his seat and attacked John Wilkes Booth. Booth whipped out this dagger that you see here and began to slash at Rathbun, cutting him down. And then he leapt to the edge of the box and his plan was to jump on the stage, but he had a little snag. He caught his spur on the flag of the box and stumbled, fell onto the stage, and broke his leg. He was able to get himself up to his feet, raising the dagger. As he ran off the stage, he yelled, Six Semper Tyrannus! which means, thus is always to tyrants. It's also the state motto of Virginia. Ran off the stage. A shocked crowd just looked on in disbelief. There was only one man that had the wherewithal to get up on that stage and chase Booth out of that theater. He jumped on stage. Booth took this track and went out the back door. Poor little Peanuts was standing there with the horse and Booth came and knocked him down with the butt of his knife and jumped up on the horse and headed for the nearest alley and was out of there in a split second and headed for the Navy Yard Bridge. This is that same location today. At the Navy Yard Bridge, he was challenged by the guard who was not supposed to let anybody cross that bridge. He asked him where he was going, what his business was, what his name was, and he said, John Wilkes Booth. And uh, the guard said, I ought not do this, but I'm going to let you pass. And Booth said, that sounds good. And they, he was let to go across the bridge into Maryland, away. At the same time, the rest of the conspiracy was beginning to fall into place too. There was an attempted assassination on Secretary of State Seward. Now, Secretary of State Seward was in bed. He was bedridden. <clears throat> he had recently been in a carriage accident and had injured himself to quite a good deal. He, uh, he had a neck brace on and was laying in bed because he had actually uh, hurt his neck very severely. And that is where he was. The conspirators knew this. And they used this as a ruse to get into his house. Louis Payne took a small box, brought it to the house, accompanied by Davy Harold, who was going to lead him out of the city because Payne didn't know his way around Washington. And they came to the Seward house here. And it was nighttime. 
Payne knocked on the door, and the butler came to the door. And Payne explained this was medicine from the doctor, and he had to deliver it personally. Well, the butler said, you can't do that. Uh, you can't come into the house, and, and denied him. And then Powell just pushed his way in to the house, where Frederick Seward, the son of the Secretary of State, heard the commotion and came downstairs and confronted Payne. At this moment, Payne pulled out a revolver, aimed it at Frederick Seward's head, and pulled the trigger. But the pistol misfired. It didn't go off. And then he turned this pistol around and used it to pistol whip Frederick Seward into submission. And then he walked down the hall, he found the room where the Secretary of State was, and jumped on his bed and began to stab him viciously. As the other men in the house heard the commotion, they came in and they began to pry him off the Secretary of State. He was pinned against the wall at one point and began to scream and rave, I'm mad, I'm mad, frightening the men, this huge behemoth, and then he ran out of the house. Now Davy Harold was outside with the horse ready to lead him out of the city, but he heard, he heard in the walls of the house, Payne screaming, I'm mad, I'm mad, and got frightened and ran off. So Payne came out into the, cities of, uh, the streets of Washington, D.C., not knowing where to go, and actually walked the street for about two or three days. He eventually found the Surratt Tavern and walked in after the assassination, after uh, after the assassination, with, uh, when Mary was, happened to be talking to federal soldiers, so he walked right into the arms of the Union Army and was captured. D.V. Harold ended up heading for that same bridge that Booth had went to, and the same thing. The guard said, I ought not let you go, but he did. He got over the bridge too. Probably because the war was over and nobody really thought that there was any danger to it. Frederick Seward survived the attack. I'm sorry, uh, Secretary of State Seward survived the attack. However, his face was horribly mutilated on the left side. He would uh, thereafter have his picture was always taken from the right, uh, except for this picture. You can see the one on the left. You can see how disfigured his face is from the attack. But what saved him? was the neck brace. That neck brace deflected the stabs of Lewis Payne. And then, as I said, he was shortly arrested thereafter. This is his uh, picture in manacles. George Atrazot was assigned to assassinate the Vice President of the United States. He took his pistol, was sitting in his room at the Kirkwood house, thought maybe a drink might help steal his nerves, and then thought maybe another drink would help, and then another. <laughs> uh, Atrazad had a, a reputation for drinking, by the way, and uh, before you knew it, he was drunk as a skunk and walking the streets of Washington and never followed through, never even attempted to assassinate the vice president. He, too, would be arrested in short order. Now, out of all the conspirators, both kidnap and assassin, after the assassination, all of them would be captured, save Booth and David Harold. David Harold would meet up with Booth later, and they would actually, they would be out uh, free for almost two weeks after this. Now, as all this was going on, back in Ford's theater, the question arose, what are we going to do with the president? Once the doctors beat down the door and they got into the box, they found that Lincoln was just slumped over the, over the box, or, uh, over the, um, sh the uh, um, rail there. And he was not breathing. And then they put him on the floor and they began to probe around to see where the wound was and they found the hole in the back of his head. And one of the doctors actually stuck his finger in and loosened a blood clot. And then Lincoln began to breathe. 
This actually helped him. It brought him back. As he's on the floor there, Laura Keene rushed up to him and put his head in her lap. And the doctors and the folks debated, what are we going to do with the president? He can't die in a theater. Then the suggestion was, let's bring him to the saloon next door. No, that's not a good place either. If a theater is bad, the saloon is even worse. The, the discussion went to, let's bring him to the White House, which was quite a distance away, and the roads were muddy and wet from that April rain. That was quickly discounted. And without even thinking where they were going to bring him, they put him on a board, brought him downstairs to the, the door of Ford's Theater, got outside, and a young man across the street stood in the doorway and said, bring him over here. This house is famously known as the Peterson House. This is where Lincoln would die. And it's still there today. He was brought into a back room onto this bed, which is actually in Springfield, uh, Illinois. Um, the Peterson House has a bed that looks like this, but it's not the actual bed. And Lincoln was stripped of his clothes, laid out in this bed, and they found pretty quickly, because he was so tall, he did not fit in the bed. They had to put him diagonally in the bed. And the doctors began to probe, and they found out that every time he stopped breathing, if they probed the hole and loosened that, that blood clot, he'd start breathing again. So they, the, they began to do this for most of the night. And as the night wore on, many people came to visit him. When they first took his clothing off, they discovered in his hat what appeared to be Lincoln's file cabinet. This is where he kept all of his documents, his personal effects. And as you see here, he had, uh, he had a newspaper, he had glasses, and he was carrying a $5 Confederate note, all kept in his hat. In his pockets, his pockets were filled with white gloves. And this was simply because Mary, whose family was more genteel, they were more, more of the upper crust, not like the, the uh, rail splitter Lincoln was, always insisted that he wear his white gloves in public. And he would, he would comply, and as soon as she was gone, he'd take them off and put them in his pocket. So he had all these gloves in his pocket. The gloves that he was wearing that night at the theater are here. They are covered in blood, as you can see. These were his effects, or his last effects. And as the night wore on, the news went out about the assassination, and many of the government dignitaries came in. Secretary of War Stanton, the fellow you see with the big beard sitting at Lincoln's side in most of these pictures, came in and he took over the show, kind of like Alexander Haig did back in the 80s. Uh, he set up a, a command post in the outer room and began issuing orders and telegraphs were sent out. He, began, he brought all the people from Ford's Theater in and interrogated them. Uh, at one point Mary was at Abraham's bedside screaming frantically and he ordered her out of the room and this is how the night went on. Everybody who was anybody stopped by to see how Lincoln was. And then it came to about seven in the morning and his breath became very, very labored. And at 7.10, 7.15, his breathing became very labored and very separated. He'd take a breath, And everybody would listen. <clears throat> Another breath. Everyone would listen. <sighs> and there was not another breath. Abraham Lincoln was gone.
It's said that uh, Secretary of War Stanton said, now he belongs to the ages. This is an amazing photograph. This photograph was taken by a gentleman who lived upstairs in the Peterson house not more than an hour after Lincoln's body was removed from the bed. You can still see the blood all over the pillow. This is an amazing document. This shows the room as it appeared just after Lincoln was taken away. And if you go to the Peterson house today, you can see this room. It's a small room. I know in some of those pictures it looked like a gymnasium with all those people in there. But this is the room where Abraham Lincoln died. And although this is not the bed, I came through here when I was 15 years old, the first time I saw the Peterson house, and it did have this on it. This is the actual pillow that you saw in that photograph earlier. It has Abraham Lincoln's blood still on it plainly. And for me, that day was an awakening. That, that day was like, uh, he's no longer the man on the penny. He's no longer the man on Mount Rushmore. This, this is a human being. This, this brought it all home. A man died here. And a death mask was made shortly after. <clears throat> the escape of John Wilkes Booth. Both he and Harold got across that bridge and they were able to meet at a place called Soper's Hill in Maryland. And then quickly thereafter, they arrived at the Surratt Tavern in Surrattsville, Clinton, today. And they came, they came up, it was a, about midnight. Booth, by this time, the adrenaline had worn off and his, his leg was, he was in searing pain. He was in utter pain. He asked, he asked Harold to do all the talking because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't squeak any words out. He was in so much pain. They arrived at the Surratt Tavern, which you see here. Now, this is a video I took of the Surratt Tavern. You can tell the amateurist uh, photography here. And this is in Clinton, Maryland, as I say. It used to be Surrattsville. And I took this on my honeymoon. Now, interesting story. My wife, who was here with me, uh, said, what do you want to do for the honeymoon before we got married? And I jokingly said, let's go to Gettysburg. And she said, that sounds great. And I was like, that's a woman I know I want to marry, yes. And uh, we went to Gettysburg, we went all the way down to D.C., we went into Maryland, we went into Virginia, basically following the track of John Wilkes Booth. And I took this outside of the tavern. This is, this is where he and Harold came that night. They picked up the field glasses, he, they were expected, they got the carbines, and they also got a bottle of whiskey, because Booth needed it at this time. Shortly after that, they made for their old friend, Dr. Mudd, who lived just several miles away. And this is, within a day, this poster was out due to the Secretary of War stand. And further, they went down to the house of Dr. Mudd. And as you see here, this is the marker outside of the house of Dr. Mudd. Now, Later on, Dr. Mudd would say, I didn't know it was him. <laughs> uh, he definitely knew it was Booth. I don't think he was expecting him because he was in on the kidnap plot and I don't think he was aware that Booth was plotting to kill Lincoln. But he knew Booth. He knew he needed help. He knew he had to have his leg set. So Dr. Mudd set Booth's leg, tore the boot off of his uh, foot and set it. We still have the actual boot that was torn off of John Wilkes Booth's leg. This is what it looks like. Now I think Dr. Mudd started to get itchy because there were federal troops all over the place. And pretty much he told John Wilkes Booth he better be on his way. And he did that. And through another connection, he was able to get further into Maryland.
towards the other end of the Potomac. And he met a, another Confederate agent by the name of Thomas Jones. And Thomas Jones's house is still there. It's called Huckleberry. And this is Thomas Jones. He was another backwoodsman. He knew the lay of the land and he knew where to hide them. He told them that he'd bring him to this safe location, which was just basically out in the woods near Huckleberry, and they hid there for several days. This, this is where Booth found out about what people thought of him. Jones and Booth had set up the secret signal. He would whistle in a certain way, and then he would come into the camp. They couldn't have a fire. They couldn't have horses, so and, and it was still April, so it was quite cold. And Booth was still had his, his leg broken, he wasn't feeling well. Booth was able to get papers from Thomas Jones and found out what the people actually thought of him. He was roundly condemned, both in the South and in the North. He was called coward for killing the president by shooting him in the back. And he was utterly shocked. He was shocked. He thought, as I said, that they were going to make a hero out of him. And now even his own, his own people, the Confederates, were calling him a coward. He was crestfallen. This is, I, I was actually able to find the actual area where they hid out in the woods. It's called the Pine Thicket. And I made this videotape here. Um, if you look out in the woods here, it's just out in those woods, but I was out in the middle of Virginia and didn't think it would be a really good idea to walk across somebody's property in Virginia, so I just shot this short video. But these are the actual woods where he hid out for those days. Uh, the marker that you saw is a couple miles away, actually. You have to do a lot of research to find out where the actual location is. And then after that, Thomas Jones, he waited for the right time to ferry them across the Potomac River into Virginia. And the time came where the heat was a little off and they were able to fer ferry Booth and Harold across. And they ended up at a place called Garrett's Farm, owned by the Garrett's family. This is what the house looked like at the time. Here's a photograph of it some years later. This house was allowed to just fall apart. This is what it looked like in the 1930s. And many people say, this is, this is really where, this was Booth's last stop. Why let this happen? But if you can imagine, the, the, the assassination was still a, a rough spot for people. And this was not a place that they wanted to preserve at the time. Us, today, we would have loved to have this house still. To furthermore complicate the matter, the site is now in the medium strip of a highway. The Garretts were tobacco farmers and initially uh, Booth and Harold came to them and said that they were returning Confederates coming back from the war. And, and you know, Booth wasn't recognizable because he had uh, you know, almost a week's growth of beard. Uh, he was haggard, he looked injured, they didn't, they didn't recognize him, so they took them for what they were. But then they noticed uh, that the federal troops who were scouring the area, every time they came close to the farm, Booth and Harold would go hide. They thought, why they're returning veterans, the war's over, why are they hiding? And then they thought that there was something, maybe they were bandits or something, so they decided to uh, no longer let them sleep in the house, but suggested that they sleep out in the tobacco barn. And this is what a tobacco barn looks like. It's got uh, big gaps so the air can get into it. So Booth and Harold were told to go sleep in the tobacco barn. And little did they know that the Garretts so mistrusted them that they went out and locked the door on them. It was about this time that the federal troops came up the driveway of the Garrett house and they told them who they were looking for. And the Garretts put one and one together and they said, we know who you're looking for. They're right over there. So the Federals surrounded the tobacco barn and called out to Booth and told him to give himself up. He refused. In fact, he said, come on in and get me, I'll kill you all. David Harold wasn't such a brave soul. He immediately said, I surrender. And Booth, was, Booth let him out of the barn. They tied him to a tree. 
And Booth continued with his tirade that he was going to take them on one by one. You know, the blue bellies are a bunch of cowards. And the, the commander of the, the unit decided that it would be probably more prudent to just light the barn on fire. And they did that to smoke them out. And this is uh, a picture showing that. And as he was hobbling around on his crutch, one of the soldiers noticed that he was starting to level his carbine as if he was going to fire towards one of his fellow soldiers. The soldier took aim and fired and hit Booth almost in the exact same spot where Lincoln was hit in the back of the head. Booth went down immediately. This soldier was one Boston Corbett. Now many, uh, many people will say that they were under order not to fire. This is not true. And uh, Corbett was not punished for this. He saw that one of his men, one of his uh, fellow soldiers was in danger and took action. After Booth was shot, they kicked open the doors and literally dragged his body out to find that he was still conscious. And then they brought him across the way to the porch of the Garrett farm. He was still conscious. And at various times, he said different things to the soldiers. At one point, he told the soldiers to come near so he could say something. He said, come here, come here. And they listened to what he had to say. And he said, tell my mother I died for my country. And then, near the end of the night, just before the sun was about to rise, he asked them to hold up his hands. And to let them go. And he couldn't hold them up. And he said, useless, useless. And just as the sun was coming over the horizon, John Wilkes Booth expired on that porch. Oh, we've got a technical difficulty here. And I don't know why that happened. Hold on. Let me try something. Hmm. I think I know what's happening. All right. Technology, it's so fun. You used to have the old slide projector where all you had to worry about was the bulb going out. <laughs> Alright, let's try that again. Okay. This, this is a, another video I shot. This actually shows the location today of the Garrett House. And as you can see, it's in the median strip of a highway. And as I got on there, the, there is, from what I read, there was a pipe that marked the southern boundary of the Garrett porch. That pipe is still there, but I also found that somebody had put a plaque there. It's a plaque from, I think, the Confederate Brotherhood commemorating John Wilkes Booth. Kind of a strange thing to see out in the middle of nowhere. And this was the spot where he spent his last moments. They found on his person a diary. In that diary, he had written out his reasons for what he did, almost like the letter that he had given over. And this was to be his last testament. He believed himself a hero. He, rather than a coward, he claimed that he walked through all of his security, all of his friends, and killed him right in front of everybody. That was no coward. And he was killing a tyrant, somebody who was becoming overwhelmingly uh, abusive of his power. The body was quickly taken back to Washington, D.C. It was identified. Uh, there are many theorists out there that say that Booth actually lived and somebody else was killed. Um, I don't believe that that's true. Uh, many of his relatives came out. They identified the body. He had a tattoo on his arm that they identified. It was John Wilkes Booth. And he was buried in a secret grave 
in the old arsenal building and then years later his family would retrieve the body and bury it in the family plot but with no marker. As all the other conspirators were captured they were put on trial and they were put on trial not in a civil court they were put on trial in a military court and this is where the trial was held in Washington DC now it was a quick trial the justices were actually officers of the Union Army a court-martial they heard all the evidence against the defendants and they were they were offered little time to really defend themselves during the trial they were permitted to sit in the back of the court here and say nothing they did have the opportunity to have lawyers make their arguments and when the trial was not happening they were to sit in their cells with hoods and manacles on and be guarded 24 7 this is the way they spent their time in jail and you have to remember this is after the assassination the nation was was livid with these people and they were going to punish them no matter what the hoods of the prisoners are still in existence as you can see here and then the sentences were handed down David Harold, death by hanging. George Atrazot, death by hanging. Mary Surratt, death by hanging. And I should mention here, her son, who was originally involved in the kidnap plot, was actually in Albany, New York and had escaped and they knew not where he was and I truly believe that they sentenced her to death in the hopes that he would uh, emerge to try to help his mother and he never did that and she went to her death not knowing where he was Louis Payne death by hanging now although the the subsequent defendants were also convicted of conspiring to kill Lincoln they got different sentences which actually indicates that they were they knew that they weren't really involved in assassinating Lincoln Dr. Mudd got life in prison imprisonment for his troubles Michael O'Laughlin life imprisonment Samuel Arnold life imprisonment now, Samuel Arnold survived and was pardoned. Michael O'Laughlin died in prison. They were all sentenced to the Dry Tortugas down in Florida, and yellow fever went through the place. Dr. Mudd was also given a pardon for his valiant efforts to save the prisoners and the guards that came down with this, and he was, he was freed after a period of a few years. And Edmund Spangler, the man that just held that horse for a few minutes, got six years for his trouble. Now, whatever happened to John Surratt? Now, I mentioned that he initially, as a young man, wanted to join the priesthood. He wanted to be a Catholic priest. He escaped and went to Europe and ended up as one of the Swiss guards in the Pope's bodyguard. Uh, eventually he was found out he tried to run they caught him he was brought back he was put on trial in a civil court and uh, faced a hung jury he got away scot-free now shortly after this he decided that he would go on a lecture tour and he was very well received at one one lecture in, in Maryland but had to close had to cancel because he had planned on doing a lecture in Washington DC and uh, a large opposition forms because people felt he was trying to profit off the death of Abraham Lincoln 
He actually lived to an old age. He died in uh, 1916. This is a picture of him later in life. Now those who were to be executed, this was, there were no appeals back then. They were building the, the gallows almost immediately. And you can imagine these people sitting in their cells as the gallows are being built. You can see the gallows here in the middle of your screen. It's about the, end of the right hand here. Here's another shot of the gallows. The prisoners are sitting in their cells listening to the sawing, the hammering, the nailing. Many of them called for their, their ministers to be brought in. This is George Atrazot receiving uh, words of advice from his minister. Davy Harold, it appears, had about six or seven uh, sisters that came to weep by his side as he was awaiting execution. Mary Surratt, who was a Catholic, had her Catholic priest there who would accompany her up to the gallows. Nobody came to visit Louis Payne. And then they were marched out to the gallows. It was a July day. It was hot, as you can see, the umbrellas were to keep the heat off. Mary Surratt is on the far left of the screen. The words were read by uh, Winfield Scott Hancock, who was the hero of Gettysburg. And you can see them affixing the hoods. Davy Harold is on the left, George Atrazad is on the right. You can, if you look closely at this picture, you can see the terror on Davy Harold's face. He looks like he's in tears. This is Mary Surratt. You can see her, her priest with the cross, having her kiss the cross. And you can see her face behind the veil. This picture was taken uh, from a distance and uh, they couldn't get Louis Payne. Recently I found this. This is a picture of Louis Payne sitting in his, his chair ready for execution. And they were made to stand, they were bound, their hands and feet were bound. Hoods were placed over their heads. And everybody left the gallows. As you can see, very, very good pictures for the time because in, in the Victorian age at this time, photography, if you move just slightly, it became a blur. And it's amazing that these photographs came out so well. And you can see, if you look really closely, you can see the terror on Mary Surratt's face through the veil. This is the way the gallows worked. They had two soldiers that just pushed out the supports and the trap door would fall. All four would be hanged at the same time. The trap door dropped and they fell to their deaths. All except for Louis Payne. His muscular neck did not snap and he strangled to death. He actually started to swing back and forth trying to knock the support out. This was the end of the conspirators in the Lincoln assassination. And do you see those holes underneath the gallows? Those are graves. And those are the caskets. And thus came an end to a horrible period in our history, but one that, as I said, if it hadn't happened, we would not be the people that we are today. And I thank you for coming out tonight. Thank you.